One of the most convenient things about Java as a programming language is that it is a garbage collected language. This means that the programming language itself, or the JVM, the Java Virtual Machine, handles cleaning up of data that's no longer useful, or in other words, that's no longer accessible in your program, versus a language like C or C++, where you have to manage pointers and references yourself, and if something is about to become inaccessible to your program or is no longer needed, then you have to deallocate it. You have to delete it. If things don't get deleted, you end up with dangling references where there's memory that's been allocated for some data, but that data is no longer usable by any of the variables in your program. And if enough of that kind of data builds up, then you have no memory space left available for data that you actually want to use in your program. Sometimes these are referred to as live references for the data that you can still access and use versus dead references, the data that you cannot access or use anymore. There are a few common algorithms for garbage collection, and I'll describe all three of them a little bit and then we'll talk about the specifics of garbage collection in Java. So one of the simplest garbage collection methods is called reference counting. This is where if you say X equals new something, then that means there's at least one reference to that new something that you created. And later on, if you say Y equals X, there are now two references to that something that you created. But if you say y equals something else, that removes one of the references, so we're down to one. And then if later I say x equals something else, or we go outside of the scope of where x existed, then that narrows us down to zero references to that object, that data. And so the system knows that it can clean up and delete that data that was there. This is a pretty simple thing to implement at the basic level, but you may see that with complex data structures like linked lists or trees, this actually is pretty difficult to implement well without still having some dangling references. For example, if I remove the next pointer to an item, in my linked list, then that does reduce the number of references to that item, but that item may still point to other data further down the linked list. Perhaps I was trying to delete the second half of my linked list, so I found the middle node and I removed the next pointer that went to the node following the middle node. And for my linked list functionality, that's just fine. I start at the head and I go next until I hit a null and I will hit a null at the place I expected to. But in terms of those nodes there, one of them had its reference removed, but the others did not. And in fact, that one that I removed via changing the next pointer, it has a previous that probably still points back to an item from the list. So if I later delete that item from the list, its reference count will still not reach zero because there's a previous that still points to it. And so any of these times that we have lots of different references in different directions, we may reach a point where our reference count just doesn't reach zero for things. And so reference counting can either leave some dangling references or will require some extra work to make sure that we actually remove all of the references when we are disconnecting something from other data that it was previously connected to. Another method is called mark and sweep, where we almost go the opposite route. At the start of each iteration of mark and sweep, we mark every object, everything in memory, everyth everything that could be referenced, we mark it false and we say, 
Let's assume there are no references to this. And then we start from roots, meaning data that is sort of the center of our program. For instance, the variables inside of our main method would make really good roots. Static variables that we know will stick around in different classes, those make other good roots. We may need multiple roots like these, but we start from one of those root references, like a variable in our main method, and we follow its references. We look inside that object, so if that object was a binary search tree, then we can follow from that object to its root, and then follow to all of the nodes that that root connects to, and so on. And as we find those connections, we mark that object as true, knowing that it's referenced somewhere, it's accessible in our program. That is the marking phase, and I would do this for anything. I would do it for another object that maybe had a reference to a scanner, and therefore I know that scanner is still live. It still has references to it, and so I mark it true. Yes, it is accessible. It is referenced. Um, if there was a grid of points, well, I would follow from the reference to that grid and then to all of its points and so on, and mark each of those true. They are referenced. And once we've finished that, there's no more connections that we can follow. It, it logically follows that anything that's still marked false has no references to it. This is a lot more overhead per single step than, say, reference counting, but it's a lot more thorough, too. And it makes sure that we can sweep out and therefore delete. The deletion is the sweeping step. We go back through all of our objects and we say, if you are not marked true, then I can delete you. There's another scheme called generational garbage collection that actually relies on this idea that most of the references we make um, become alive and dead pretty quickly after. We make temporary variables, we make placeholders, we make lots of little bits of data and references that we use for a short time and then are done with. And so it actually uses a scheme where when references are created, when objects are created, they go into an early generation. And there's a lot of attention paid to those early generation ones to see if they are ready to be deleted yet. And if we do a check for whether any of them are ready to be deleted yet, and they were not ready to be deleted, then we move them to the second generation. And the second generation gets checked a little less frequently. And the third generation gets checked a little less frequently than the second, and so on. This saves us some work. We need a scheme within it, and that can vary. So for instance, in Java, it uses a combination of mark and sweep and generational garbage collection. So it does the marking and sweeping a lot more often on newer objects because they might just be temporary. And then it moves them to an older generation that might only get mark and sweep done to it half as often as the newer objects and so on. So it can save us some overhead and as you heard when I described mark and sweep, it's a very exhaustive process. And so if we can save some work on it, um, we should. And so Java uses a combination of those two different schemes. We, when we create a garbage collection scheme, it can be blocking, incremental, or concurrent, meaning it can stop the whole program to do its garbage collection. It can do little bits at a time, or it can be written in a way that it runs in, say, a separate thread and is done concurrently with our program's regular execution. These are all different possibilities for it. Um, and we may also sometimes have schemes that do compacting, trying to sort of smash down any data that, that can be um, to, to create smaller amounts of memory used even with those things that are alive or that are dead. We won't get into that too much. So as I said, Java's garbage collection does a hybrid of mark and sweep 
and generational. It will do that full exhaustive search at some points, um, but it most often does it for objects that are newer, then it moves them to a second generation, and it will do checking on those a lot less frequently and checking on the third a lot less frequently than that, and so on, with some upper limit on it. It's done periodically as the system determines that memory needs cleaned up is to getting too full. Um, and the trick is that our programs can suggest to Java the runtime that garbage collection should be done, but we cannot force it to be done. Um, the garbage collection scheme calls a method called finalize on objects before they get deleted. This is where we can do cleanup of whatever things need cleaned up in our objects. If we had some files, some temporary files we had created for that object, then we should make sure to delete them there. If we have some network connections or logins or something like that, that we want to make sure get gracefully closed, we would do that in a finalize method. Um, calling finalize on an object does not tell the garbage collector to delete it. It would just do whatever steps are in the finalize method. Um, so again, we cannot force the garbage collector to delete this object the way that in C or C++ we can force memory to be deallocated. Um, you should always call super.finalize to make sure that any parent classes get a chance to clean up their data too. If you're very desperate to keep a particular object alive, you can try to resurrect it here. For instance, create some new reference to it so that Java doesn't delete it. Um, but this can lead to very bad and disturbing behavior. And so it's probably not the best practice. Here is an example of a finalize method. You'll notice a couple of things about its structure, perhaps, that it's kept its main body in a try. It has no catch because in this case, I don't know what the graceful way is to recover from your temporary files not getting deleted um, or from your socket not closing. Um, if those don't work, it's just going to not skip whatever the rest of it was because something's very wrong in a way that may not be recoverable. But in a finally, it calls to super.finalize to make sure that its parent class gets to clean up anything that it needs to clean up as well. So if the parent class had any temporary files, any network connections open, any final changes that needed to be made to a database or something like that, then it's able to do that too. And we put it in the finally to make absolutely certain that it happens every time whether this try succeeded or not, the parent class should get its chance to call finalize as well. As I mentioned before, garbage collection is done by the Java runtime. And so we can actually get access to the runtime while our program is running to examine some different things about it. Um, we can use the built-in runtime class and get the active runtime that our program is running under. We can suggest to the, the, the JVM that garbage collection should happen, but that does not mean it instantly will happen. Similarly, we can suggest that finalize ought to be called, but we cannot force finalize to be called. This might be a good thing to do if your program creates lots of temporary files and your finalizes are what clear up those temporary files, you may want to um, make sure that intermittently you're suggesting to Java, even if memory is not full, uh, I don't want my hard drive to fill up with temporary files, so could you pro pro possibly run finalize for all of the things that need cleaned up? Um, we can query what the amount of free space in the memory allotted for Java is, what, what memory is available to Java still right now. We can ask what the total memory is um, that's currently allotted to Java. And then we can also ask what the maximum amount of memory is that the JVM is allowed to use. This may be different 
than the total memory available to our, uh, oh, sorry, it, it will typically be different. This is, I'm sorry, the total memory that is allotted currently um, versus the maximum amount that the JVM is allowed to use. Um, okay, so we can also write code that references different objects in memory, but does so sort of gently so that those objects aren't held if memory needs to be freed. Uh, an example of where this kind of thing might need to be done in a program is if you wrote code that did logging of what happens in, say, user connections inside of your program or any kind of logging for your program, well, you don't want every object in memory to get held in memory because the logging program was keeping track of that object. You want your logging program to have a reference to that stuff if it needs to see how big your binary search tree has gotten or what data is being sent over the network connection or things like that. You want to have a reference to it to be able to query that sort of stuff. But you want the network connection to get garbage collected when the user is no longer using it. And you want the files to, you know, file objects to get garbage collected when nobody is actually accessing that file anymore, things like that. So your logging code might hold weaker references to the objects that it's, it's keeping logging information about. Um, this is also useful for data, which you could easily reload from a file and you don't care about the performance hit from that, but you want to make sure that your memory is still flexible and able to be allocated for other things or stuff that you could recalculate or yeah, again, if it just doesn't matter if it goes away during execution, um, if the data is deleted and you call get on that reference, then it will return null. So these are just sort of wrapper classes that allow us to sort of have a variable that points to something, but doesn't point to it in a way that causes the garbage collector to keep that thing in memory forever. There are three generic subclasses that you can use. They are in decreasing strength of reference. I will not get into the exact details of how those are prioritized and, and things like that. But there is soft reference, weak reference, and phantom reference, which is the weakest of these references. It will be let go of the easiest by the garbage collector. You can build your own weak data structures. So you could create a binary search tree that's willing to let go of its nodes if memory needs cleared or needs uh, yeah cleared out. Um, or you can use some built-in weak data structures like a weak hash map. So if you had user records that you were loading in and they were large and if they hadn't been used for a while or if memory really needed cleared up, then fine, you can, you can delete them. It's not a big deal. You could load them back in from the database or from a file or something like that. Then you might create a weak hash map of those user rec records and be able to just say, you know, if I don't get it back, that's fine. I know where the file is. I'll, I'll have the program look it up there. So here's an example, an image that yeah, I don't care if it goes away. I'll reload it from a file. Not a big deal. So we create a weak reference of type image and we call it data. And that's just a private instance variable, private field. And then we keep the file name so we know where to look it up if it goes away. Our constructor takes the file name, stores it in that variable. This variable is not a weak reference, so that variable is not going away. But it's also small compared to, say, an entire multiple megabyte large image. So we store the file name, and then we do a try-catch because it could give I.O. exceptions. That's the only reason that this is here. Um, to create, to read in the image from a file, and we create a weak reference to it. So yes, that image is put in memory, but if memory gets full, that's okay, delete it. It's not a problem. That's really all this is saying. If I want to get the image itself, then I write, I've i written this get method 
that will try to get from that data, from that weak reference called data. It will call get because the reference objects you call get to see if they have their data still, to see if they have their reference still. If it comes back null, that's fine. I'll read it back in from the file. Otherwise, I'll return the value that I got from there. So this just rereads it if we didn't have it still in memory. Uh, there probably should be a return here. Um, that seems to be missing. But the overall idea is that we're just, we're keeping a weak reference to it. If, if you try to get it and it's not there, that's fine. Read it back in from the file. If it is there, you can just return it right away. So this allows that memory to be garbage collected if it needs to be, but holds on to it if, if there's space and can just restore or if your program could do without it when that's not there. That's also fine too. So we've seen that garbage collection allows us to free up memory and tell what things are currently useful, meaning that they have references, they're accessible through some variable in our program, or are not useful anymore and can be deleted away, can be cleared away. Java uses a combination of the uh, mark and sweep and generational methods of garbage collection. And the JVM will allow us to see some things about memory and how much is used and how much is available. And it will even let us make suggestions about garbage collection needing to be done, but we cannot force it to be done. We also, on the other hand, can hold on to data in ways that is flexible and allows us some references without forcing those items to stay in memory if they're not used by something other than our weak reference to them there.